الحمد للہ وصلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ وعلیٰ علیہ وصاب اجمعین اما بعد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم والعصر ان الانسان لفی خسر اللہ الدین آمن و امن الصالحاتی و تواصو بالحق تواصو بالصبر رب شلی صدری و سلی عمری وحل العقدت من لسانی حفقہ و قولی I welcome all the viewers of the Peach TV Network, the Peach TV English, the Peach TV Urdu, the Peach TV Bangla, and the Peach TV Chinese, as well as my four social media platforms, which are the Facebook, the YouTube, the Instagram, and Twitter. I welcome all the viewers with their Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. I welcome you to the program, Ask Dr. Zakir and his son Farik. This is the session number, this is the season number two, session number five. And I would like to thank Farik for answering the first two questions. And from here onward, inshallah, I will take over and answer the remaining questions. You are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and compatible religion or any question that a non-Muslim may have posed you or an atheist may have posed you and you are unable to reply. Or any question that you find on the media against Islam, this is the opportunity. You can ask your questions on any of my four social media platforms, but the best would be to ask your question in brief as a text message to the WhatsApp mentioning your question in brief along with your name, your profession, the city and country of your origin to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five. I repeat plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five. Before we throw the floor open for the open question and session, I would like to give to the viewers, I would like to give to the viewers two important messages. The first is my message on the eve of the independence of my beloved country India. Today is the 15th of August. Today is the 15th of August. 2020, it is the 73rd anniversary of the independence of India. I would like to inform the viewers that Alhamdulillah, several centuries before, India was one of the most powerful countries in the world. It was one of the richest countries in the world. It was the most, one of the most resourceful countries in the world. It was the most forward country in the world, alhamdulillah. And India was ruled by the Muslims for about a thousand years. And when the Muslims ruled India, alhamdulillah, all the Indians, irrespective to whichever religion they belonged, whether they be Hindus, whether Muslims, whether Christians, whether Sikhs, all of them, they lived harmoniously together. And the country developed and it was one of the best countries in the world to live in. Yes, there were wars, but that was for power, that was for land, and on both the sides you would find Hindus and Muslims. There was no war based on religion. The human beings on the platform of religion, they did not fight with each other. And Alhamdulillah, the advancement that India made was phenomenal. Until a couple of centuries before, the Britishers, they came to India. They came to India to do business and they formed an East India Company. But what did they do? They came to India, they looted India. They cheated India. They ruled India. They ruined India. They destroyed India. They took away all the resources of India, all the wealth of India to the country. And they made India a country which was 
known to be one of the lowest countries in the world. The GDP went down, the wealth went down. It was at its lowest. Alhamdulillah. There were tens and hundreds of thousands of Indians from the Hindu community, from the Muslim community, from the Sikh community, from the Christian community, who unitedly fought for the freedom of India. And Alhamdulillah, 73 years before, on the 15th of August, 1947, my beloved country, our beloved country, India, it got its independence, its freedom from the clutches of the Britishers. But unfortunately, when the Britishers left India, they left behind the disease of divide and rule. From the time the Britishers left in 1947, more than 65 years later, Alhamdulillah, India kept on progressing. After independence, for more than 65 years, India progressed economically in terms of wealth, in terms of education, in terms of time and technology, in terms of science and technology, and it advanced. And Alhamdulillah, again India, though did not reach on top of the world, but it came somewhere, Alhamdulillah, close to the developing countries. And India progressed. But unfortunately, since the last six years, especially last four to five years, India is deteriorating again. The GDP has gone down. The wealth has gone down. The economy has gone down. The unemployment has increased. And there is more lynching. There is anarchy. There is loss of peace. Since this present government has come to power, since the last six years, we find that our country is deteriorating. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He free us also from the clutches of this fascist new government that is controlling my beloved country for the last six years. I could see a ray for I could see a ray of hope last few months. When this government bought laws against the minority, especially the Muslims, Alhamdulillah, the majority community, the Hindus, they stood shoulder to shoulder with the Muslims. The Christians came forward, the Sikh came forward. And Alhamdulillah, they stood shoulder to shoulder with the Muslims against the wrong policies of the government. A few months ago, the same government engineered riots in the capital city of the country, India. And the main aim was to disturb, to kill the minority, especially the Muslims. And they engineered riots. Alhamdulillah, you could find many people from the majority community, many from the Hindi community, from the Hindu community, who risked their life and they saved the lives of many Muslims. At the same time, many Muslims in the Muslim majority area, they saved the lives of the Hindus. This is what is unity. And we can see that inshallah again, India may go back to its glory. I would like to tell this new government that you can fool some people some of the times, but you cannot fool all the people all the times. The best way that a country can develop is when there is peace, when there is harmony, when there is development, when there is economic growth. Not when you try and divide the community, the people of India on the basis of religion, on the basis of religion, just for power and money of a selected few people, the politicians, they are destroying this country. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he get this beloved country of mine, India, independence from this government. And inshallah, inshallah, I feel that time will come soon again when India again will be a superpower. My second message is regarding the importance of Muharram and fasting on the day of Ashura.
our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number four, hadith number 3197, that our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that in a year, there are 12 months. The year is 12 months. And of them, four are sacred. Three are in consecutive numbers. That is Dhul Qaeda, Dhul Hijjah, and Muharram. And the fourth is Rajab. A similar message is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 36, where Allah says that the number of months in the sight of Allah are 12 in a year. So he ordained the creation of the heavens and the earth. And from them, four are secret. And but naturally, these four sacred months are mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, as I mentioned earlier. That is Dhul Qaeda, Dhul Hijjah, Muharram, and Rajab. So, do not do wrongdoings in them. Here Allah is saying in Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 36, that in these four sacred months, do not do any wrongdoings. That means, if a person does any sin, the sins are more graver in these four sacred months. They are more heavier in these four sacred months. And the good deeds that you do, they will be more rewarding. So, the Muslims should see to it that during the four sacred months, they should be more careful. They should abstain from all the sins, especially the major sins, as well as almost all the minor sins too. And we should do as many good deeds as possible. Time will not permit me to re repeat all the good deeds. And I've done that earlier when I spoke about the virtues of Dhulijjah. I had mentioned 45 good deeds. The Farais, the Mustahab, the other Sunnahs, etc. It is further mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number 3, Hadith number 2755. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the most important fast after the fast of Ramadan is in the month of Allah in Muharram, referring to the day of Arafah, referring to the day of Ashura. And the most important Salah after the first Salah is the night prayers, that is the Qayyamul Layl, Tajud, and the Witr. It's further mentioned in Sahih Muslim, Muhammad number 3, Hadith number 2746, our beloved Prophet said that fasting on the day of Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, I will pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He forgive the sins of the previous year. That means if a person fasts on the 10th of Muharram, on the day of Ashura, all your sins of the previous year will be washed away. But natural, these sins are referring to the minor sins, not counting the major sins. That means the most important fast after the further fast of Ramadan is the fasting of Ashura. But scholars differ, Fokahas, most of the fuqah say that the most important fast is the fasting on the day of Arafah because on the day of Arafah, besides the sins of the previous year being washed away, even the sin of the future one year is washed away. That means if you fast on the day of Arafah, two years of sins are washed away. The previous year and the following, that is the next year. If you fast on the day of Ashura, 
only one year that the previous year's sins are washed away. Therefore, Fuqah has deferred, most of them say, the most important fast is Arafah. Few say the most important fast is fasting on the day of Ashura. But unanimously all agree that these two fasts, fasting on the day of Arafah and fasting on the day of Ashura, are the most two important fasts after the fast of Ramadan. It is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 5, hadith number 3943, that Ibn Abbas, an, that may Allah be pleased with him, he narrates that when the Prophet reached Madinah, he found that the Jews were fasting on the 10th of Muharram. And he asked them, that why do you fast during this day? They said, this day Allah gave victory to Moses and the people of Bani Israel over Pharaoh. So the Prophet replied that we Muslims are more closer to Musa salam than the Jews. And he ordered the Muslims to fast on Ashura, the 10th of Muharram. It's further mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. Volume number 3, hadith number 2006, that Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, he narrates that he never found the Prophet wanting to fast on any day more than the day of Ashura and this month, that is the month of Ramadan. It is further mentioned in Sunan Abu Daud, volume number 3, hadith number 2455, that the Prophet, peace be upon him, the people approached him and they told him that the Jews and the Christians, they fast on the 10th of Muharram, on the day of Ashura. So the Prophet said, next year we will also fast on the 9th of Muharram. It's mentioned in, in the book of Mustad Ahmad, volume number 2, hadith number 2154, that the Prophet said, do the opposite of what the Jews and the Christians do. Besides fasting on the 10th of Muharram, also fast on the 9th or the 11th of Muharram. Because of this, when you read the Shara of Sayyid Bukhari, Hafiz Ibn Hajar Asqalani, he says that fasting of Ashura is of three levels. The lowest is fasting on the 10th of Muharram, the day of Ashura. The second is fasting on the 9th and the 10th of Muharram. And the highest is fasting on 9th, 10th and 11th of Muharram. That means we Muslims, we learn from all the hadith that Muharram is the month of Allah. It's one of the four sacred months. In these sacred months we should do good deeds, abstain from doing bad deeds. And the best is that we fast on all three days, the 9th, the 10th, and the 11th of Muharram. That is the best. If you cannot fast for three days, at least fast for two days. 9th and 10th of Muharram, or 10th and 11th of Muharram. If you cannot fast for two days and you can only do for one day, then the least of the least you can do is fast at least on the 10th of Muharram on the day of Ashura. This was the short message during this was a short message. This was a, this was a short message on the importance of Muharram and fasting on the day of Ashura. Inshallah, we will take questions. 
from the people. First, we'll take questions from the WhatsApp. The first question that we have, that has been selected on the WhatsApp is from Abdur Rahman from India. Presently working in Kuwait as a mechanical engineer. You are my favorite in the field of Dawah. Your speech is very logical and intellectual, Alhamdulillah. I love you. I love you too. I feel you are one of my family members. I feel the same. All the Muslims are brothers unto one another, brothers in faith, inshallah. I am your follower since 2011. I always share your videos to my family members and encourage them to watch it. As you know, for Muslims, it is getting very difficult to live in India. I feel Allah is testing the Iman of Indian Muslims through the ruling party. The ruling government propagates false news about you and files false cases against you. You are a very famous person and you have good links with other countries. So you were able to do hijrah to Malaysia. Alhamdulillah. Allah saved you. Alhamdulillah. There are many cases like this in India against Muslims. False cases are filed and false arrests are made under UAPA Act. The common Muslims don't have the opportunity or the option to do hijrah. So what is your advice for common Muslims who undergoes a similar situation like you in India? How Muslims can handle or tackle this type of issue? The brothers asked a very important question, a very sensitive question, seeing the situation of India, as I mentioned in the message of the Independence Day, that since the last four to six years, there is a lot of onslaught against the Muslim minorities in India, and you find a lot of lynching, a lot of attacks on the Muslims, it is being difficult for Muslims to live, they are being harassed, they are being persecuted, they are being oppressed, and so on and so forth. So the question posed by with Abdul Rahman is that I was able to hijrah, what should the common Muslims do? What should the common Muslims in India do in such a situation? I can give my advice, it can be in two different categories. One is Muslims as a whole, as the Ummah in India, what they should do, and Muslims on an individual level. As far as the Muslims in India as a whole, number one, they should be united. Unfortunately, the Muslims are divided in India, divided on basis of different sects in Islam, divided on basis of different organization, divided because they belong to different political parties, they belong to dif different social organization, and this is the major problem amongst the Muslims living in India. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103. Hold all together strongly to the rope of Allah and be not divided. We Muslims should be united holding to the rope of Allah. The rope of Allah is the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of a beloved Prophet. If all the Muslims in the India, if all the Muslims in India hold strongly to the glorious Quran and to the authentic hadith of a beloved Prophet, Inshallah, we will be a strong force. We will be united and will be a formidable power, mashallah. Unfortunately, we Muslims, as I mentioned, we are divided into different sects in Islam. And the different groups, the different religious groups in India, they are fighting among themselves, they are criticizing each other, they are attacking each other. This is totally uncalled for. There is no problem 
that there are different groups as far as religious organizations are concerned, as far as difference of opinion is concerned. But as a whole, the Muslims should be united. And the best uniting factor is the glorious Quran and the authentic Hadith. We Muslims should agree to disagree. There can be many religious organizations, no problem. But we should not fight with one, with one another, with one another. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number two, that help one another in bir and taqwa, in righteousness and good deeds. Number two, we are divided politically. Some of the Muslims, they support political party A, some support political party B, some support political party C. And what happens? Our votes get divided and the net result is zero. Do you know that we Muslims, Alhamdulillah, according to the official statistics of the Indian government, more than 10 years back, it says that Muslims are 14.2%. And a few years back they said that we are more than 200 million Muslims in India. And I'm aware that they are not counting many Muslims in Assam and many parts of India. Actually, according to me, the Muslims will be close to 250 to 300 million in India. The actual figure. The government suppresses the figure. Officially, Indonesia is considered as a country which has the maximum number of Muslims, about 240 million Muslims. But according to me, number one in the world, the country which has maximum number of Muslims, it is my beloved country, India. Minimum 250 to 300 million. But even if you count and you agree with the government statistic that we are about 200 million, what we should do, that politically, we should have only one party. We Muslims should take we Muslims should make another party exclusively only for Muslims. And this party should be a force by itself, irrespective of whichever, whichever group of Muslim do you belong to, whichever sect of Muslim do you belong to, whichever mother you belong to, whichever religious organization you belong to, whichever social Muslim organization you belong to, we Muslims should only have one political party and this political party should join hands with the other political parties which are not fascist which are not communist number one they should join hands with the dalits the dalits in india also are about 300 million unfortunately during voting they are counted as hindus and the dalits are not hindus Baba Sahib Ambedkar had left Hinduism and he loved Islam but unfortunately the Muslims didn't welcome them so he chose the second best, he chose Buddhism so the neo Buddhists, they are Hindus but for the political gain these parties they count them as Hindus and they take benefit of them but these Dalits are also being persecuted in India so what we should do, we Muslims should join hand with the Dalit so that we will be close to 600 million, more than 40% of the population. We can join hand with the other minorities and then we will be a bigger force. And depending upon the situation where you are, even if you feel that we cannot come to power, we should support those parties which are non-communal, those parties which care for humanity, not those parties which divide the country on the basis of religion, not those parties that persecute the minorities, that do not give the rights to the minorities. And if you see in the Islamic history, the best religious group that ever gave rights to the minority are the Muslims. The minorities in a Muslim rule get all the rights. And they are protected by the Muslim rulers. And even today you see that in majority of the Muslim majority country, whether it be the Gulf country, whether it be other Muslim countries, the Hindus are there. But they aren't being persecuted. They aren't being forced to say Allah Akbar. So we should support politically those non-Muslim parties. We can join with them. 
Oh, Muslim party have a coalition, no problem. But individually, all the Muslims of India should be united. What happened nowadays that one Muslim joins political party A, the second Muslim joins political party B, third Muslim joins political party C, fourth Muslim joins political party D, one Hindu comes and stands alone in a Muslim majority area, which may be having 75% Muslims, the Muslim votes are divided, and this Hindu comes and wins the election in a Muslim majority area. Why? Because the Muslims are divided. We are foolish. So if we Muslims are united and we have one force, unfortunately, unfortunately, we don't find a single good Muslim politician in India who we can say that he really cares for the deen of Allah and the Muslims more than his personal gain. So we Muslims should be united under one political party and should keep our differences aside and keep our personal preferences. Today what we find that one non-Muslim political party makes a Muslim as a member of Rajya Sabha, so he supports that political party even if that party is against the Muslim, he supports them unequivocally, without any condition. It's a shame. These Muslims are selling the Muslims of India. The major problem is that we Muslims don't have a leader in India. We have lack of leadership, not only in India, throughout the world. So my suggestion would be that the Muslims should join together, forget our differences. Like if you see the history of the Khulfa Rashidin, when they ruled, when they were Khalifas, they were first interested in seeing that they did not disappoint Allah. They were least bothered about their personal gain, about the benefit of the family, about the luxury. They were more bothered about are they pleasing Allah or not. Today, unfortunately, we don't have such politicians. If we follow Quran and Sunnah and stick to it, and the Muslims are united, inshallah, no one will be able to trample us in this country of India. This is number one requirement collectively as the Muslim Ummah. Number two, individually as a Muslim, what can you do in such a situation? What can you do when the Muslims aren't joining together, when they aren't uniting, when they are divided? What as you individual Muslim who cares for the deen, who wants to follow Allah and his command, what should you do? Number one, as a Muslim, you should see to it that you are doing your faraiz. You are doing all the fars. As much as mustab that you can, you are doing it freely. And India is one of the few countries in the world which is mentioned in the constitution that every citizen of India, irrespective of whichever religion he belongs to, he can preach, practice and propagate his religion. And I did that for more than 25 years. Only in the last few years, as I mentioned earlier, that when this new government came, the faces government came, and they changed the full scenario of India, we have to see to it that we get back where we had the freedom. So number one, a Muslim should follow his deen. If you feel that you are living and you cannot practice your faraiz, you cannot do most of your sunnah, then Allah clearly mentions in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number 97, that you have to do hijrah. And I've discussed this in detail in my earlier answer. It's a fard. Hijrah can be of various types. Number one, if you have the means and the possibility to go to a Muslim majority country, that would be the best. And the person who asked the question, he himself is living in Kuwait, which is a Muslim majority country. You can do hijrah permanently, you can do partially, you can do temporarily, depending upon the situation. Number two, I don't expect, and I've given this in my early answer, that Muslims should live in India, I don't expect that. I'm talking of individual case that if you are a Dai, and if the persecution gets so much, like it happened in my case, that's a different situation. I don't expect all the Muslims of India to live in India, not at all, that's not the solution. The solution is number one. Politically, we should become united, we should have one force, join hands 
the Dalits and the other people who have more human values and see to it that we follow the constitution of India of equality. If you cannot and I don't expect people to leave the country, what you can do is you can shift. <coughs> you can shift or do hijrah to a different state which is more lenient towards Muslim. And one of the best examples that I can think of amongst all the more than 28, 29 states that are there in India, the best that I can think of <coughs> amongst all the states of India that we have, more than 28, 29 states, the best state that I can think of it is Kerala. Where Kerala, alhamdulillah, has about one-third Hindus, one-third Christians, and one-third Muslims. And there the people of Kerala are not communal in nature. The people of different religions, they live harmoniously. I've been to Kerala many times. There is no friction between different religions. They have their religious activities. And all of them can propagate their religion peacefully. And this government doesn't have much hold in the state of Kerala. So one of the best options that if you want to do hijra to another state, I would say Kerala. There are some states which are less communal. They are, but less as compared to some states which are very communal. The less communal would be Bombay where I come from, or maybe Hyderabad or some other. Some are very communal, like UP, etc. So depending you can do hijra to another state, or maybe in your state, to a different city which is less communal. Or maybe in your city, live in an area which is more safe. Like in Bombay, one of the safest places to live is Dongri, it is Baikalla. All these areas are, have got 90%, 95% Muslim, some are 85% Muslim. So depending upon the situation, if, if collectively the Muslim Mumbai is not coming together and they are not doing the job, they aren't following Quran and Sunnah. You as an individual Muslim should follow the Quran and Sunnah and see to it that if it's difficult where you're living, you do hijra into another state or to another city or to another area in your city itself. Depending on the situation, I know doing hijra is not easy. You may have to go to a new place. You may have to sell your house where you're living and go to a new house. But this is the advice given to us in the Quran to hijra. If you are really a very famous personality and the government will come after you in any state, then the best is to do hijra outside the country. If you cannot do permanently, you can seek a job in a Muslim country, in the Gulf country, depending upon the situation. But Allah is very clear cut in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 97, 98, 99, 100, that if you are living in a non-Muslim country and you cannot follow your deen, you have to do hijra. Unless, if you don't have the power, if you don't the capab if you don't have the capability and the capacity, then Allah will forgive you if you are among the weak and the oppressed. This was in brief, and I pray to Allah SWT, may the Muslims of India, they unite together religiously, they unite together socially, they unite together politically, and become one united force, inshallah, we will get back our past glory that we had, inshallah. Hope that answers the question. <coughs> we have on the Facebook, Rauf Khan, Asif Ahmed, Constantine and Caesar. Sani Adamu Bello, Abdul Hamid Suleiman, may God protect you, may Allah protect you too. Mata Buddin, Assalamu Alaikum, Alaikum Salam, Muhammad Asghar Ali, Ayan Khan, I really admire you, sir. Jadakallah, I really admire you, sir. Jadakallah, Mr. Shaukat Mir, I love you, I love you too. Watching from Kashmir, Khan Zafar, Mustafa Rahman, Muhammad Mubarak Hussein, Rashidul Khan from Bangladesh, Ahmad. Hanaf, Zahid Kalim Baloch, love you from Pakistan, I love you too. 
محمد امیر نور السلام علیکم علیکم السلام دلاور حسین یو آر لیجنڈ آف دا ورلڈ سر مہتاب الدین روپم سنن سپتو حمید صفی راج راج مسل ماشاء اللہ حمید صفی وی نیڈ اے مسلم لیڈر تجبین شان ظہیر خان فرام منی پور انڈیا وعلیکم السلام ٹو آل آف یو آن دا یوٹیوب وی ہیو دانیل ذوالفکر مسٹر میڈیکو سید سید کیف جاوید بلال احمد زدید جریریا منہج لف فرام کشمیر سنپر کیٹ السلام علیکم علیکم السلام مزمل خان فچ فولدین محمد صدیم عبدالحکیم السلام علیکم علیکم السلام منہج لف فرام کشمیر ذاکر سر لو یو ٹو توقیر جمال to inform the viewers that there are many questions which are asked which have already been answered by me so whichever question has been answered by me in the past sessions I will not repeat that I request the viewers go back to the YouTube channel or to the Facebook all these answers are there go in the search type the question in my name and you get the reply many questions are being repeated I will not answer the same question again It's a, waste of, it's a waste of time for those people already there. So my request to you would be go to the YouTube channel and you can search and find these answers. There's a question on the YouTube that from Brother Abdul Rahman from Mumbai, India that many times we cannot log in to your YouTube channel. What is the reason and how do we see your YouTube channel in India? The reason that many of the people from India cannot log in to my channel is because the Indian government has blacklisted, has blacklisted my channel. They don't want people to watch the message of peace that I'm spreading. So because of that, if you go to my channel and type Zakir Naik or Dr. Zakir channel, you log in, you cannot reach. But there is an easy solution for that. What you have to do is you have to go to the settings and in your setting, you change the location from India to any other country, change it to Saudi Arabia, change it to USA, change it to UK, and then if you log in, inshallah, without any problem, you can log into my channel. Because the Indian government doesn't want peace to be spread throughout India, they are trying the level best to avoid my message to reach India. So the best solution is go to the setting, go to the location, change the location to any other country like Saudi Arabia, UK, USA, and inshallah, easily you can log in to my channel. The second option is that you can use a VPN and through v VPN, Virtual Protocol Network, through any of the VPN which is available free from the App Store or from the Google Store, through a VPN you can easily enter. So these are the two ways that you can get. Being in India, you can see my channel and mashallah, alhamdulillah, there are many people from India seeing and that's how you can get all these questions. The next question is 
from Brother Rizwan from West Bengal, India. Which is the most important and effective method of giving dawah? There are various different ways and strategies of doing dawah. Some are less effective, while some are more effective. The most common method used by Muslims while doing dawah to non-Muslims is that whenever they meet a non-Muslim, they speak hundred good things about Islam. Even if that non-Muslim agrees with those hundred, with those hundred good things we have mentioned regarding Islam, yet at the back of his mind, at the back of his mind, he will think, ah, you are the same Muslim who is a terrorist. Ah, you are the same Muslim who is a fundamentalist. You are the same Muslim who marries more than one woman. You are the same Muslim who subjugates the woman by keeping her behind the veil. These few negative factors at the back of his mind will prevent him from accepting the beauty of Islam. Whenever I meet a non-Muslim, the first question I ask him, I ask him up front. That with your limited knowledge, whether you are right or wrong, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? And I make him comfortable. You can criticize Islam, you can attack Islam, you can speak against the Quran, no problem. You only tell me what do you feel is wrong with Islam. And after making him comfortable, he poses about three or four questions. And invariably, these three or four questions fall amongst the 20 most common questions asked by non-Muslims regarding Islam. If every Muslim memorizes and knows the reply to these 20 most common questions asked by non-Muslims, quoting from Quran and Sahih Hadith, quoting from the scriptures of the non-Muslims, the Bible, the Vedas, giving answer with reason and logic, giving answer on the basis of science. Inshallah, even if he cannot convert the non-Muslims, he can at least neutralize the animosity which they have. The logic is, when the cup is full, when you pour, it will overflow. So first empty the cup. Whatever misconceptions the non-Muslim have regarding Islam, you first remove it, then even if you speak a few good points about Islam, he will accept it. These 20 common questions, how do they arise in the minds of the non-Muslim? Depending on how the media portrays Islam and the misconception they spread, these 20 common questions keep on changing. The 20 common questions we have today, 10 years back, they were different. Few decades earlier, they were different. Depending upon how the media portrays Islam, these 20 common questions keep on changing. And these 20 common questions are the same throughout the world. Whether you go to America, UK, Singapore, Saudi Arabia, Dubai, whichever part of the world you go to, India, these 20 common questions are the same. There may be an additional two or three questions based on the society and the customs of that particular country. Maybe if you go to western country where interest is more common, they may ask you why is interest private in Islam. But the remaining 20 com common questions are the same. So it's preferable to learn the answers of the 20 most common questions than to learn answers of 100 uncommon questions. So number one is, you memorize the reply which are good, and I've written a book on this, on the common questions asked by non-Muslims, or misconception of Islam, and it's translated to various languages of the world, and you memorize it, it's one of the best ways to do dawah. One of the most important criteria for dawah is given in the glorious Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, the chapter number three. Verse number 64, where Allah says, Kul ya hal kitab, so people of the book, ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa in bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as will assign you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bi shayyo. That we associate no partner with him. Wala yattakhiz abad dun abad dun arba bin minunillah. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fain tawallah. And if they turn back, Fakulu Shadu, say Ibabitis, we are the Muslimun, that we are Muslims bowing over to Allah. 
So one of the best criteria of doing dawa is come to common terms as between us and you. Coming to common terms with the non-Muslim is one of the best criteria of dawa. Ta'ala ila kalimatin sawa in baina bainakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. And amongst the common term, the most important term is Allah, na'muda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala anna shirika bihi shayyo. That we associate no partner with him. Wala yattakhidha ba'duna ba'dan arbaban minullah. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. That means when you are doing dawah, the most important point of dawah is tawhid. Removing shirk from the life of the non-Muslim. While starting dawah, you can start dawah with Quran and science. You can start dawah with literature, depending upon which subject the person is interested in. No problem. But your main aim should be, you have to convince him about Tawheed, about one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worshipping him alone and no one else, and remove the shirk in his life. This is the most important. If you cannot do this, your dawah is useless. You may convince him, you may convince the non-Muslim not to have alcohol, you may convince him not to have pork, you may convince him not to gamble, but if you do not remove, if you do not remove the shirk from his life, you do not remove the idol worship from his life, you do not get him to tawheed, oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the dawah is useless. That is the reason for a da'i, his main goal should be convincing about tawheed, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then number two is about the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These two are the most important criteria for Dawah. All the other aspects are secondary. You can start with other things in which the non-Muslim is interested, but these two are the most important. Then will come Akhirah, then will come Salah, so on and so forth. While coming to common terms, it's important that if you read the scriptures of the non-Muslims, you will be in a better position to talk about Tawheed mentioned in the scriptures, and I've given the talk on concept of God in major world religions and speak and I proved from the Bible, from the Vedas, from the scriptures of Christians, Jews, Hindus, Parsis, about oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've given a talk on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the various world religious scriptures and from the scriptures of the Christians, Jews, Hindus, from the scriptures of the Parsis, I've proved the coming of the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad So if you're doing da'wah and if you read the scripture, this is one of the criteria mentioned in the Quran, it becomes easier. The other important verse of the Quran for technique of da'wah is Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse number 125 it says, Udu Invite all to the way of the Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Here Allah is saying that invite all, invite the non-Muslims to the teachings of Islam, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with hikmah and husna. When you do dawa, you have to do dawa with hikmah and husna, with reason, with wisdom and beautiful preaching. But many people think that wisdom always means being soft. Yes, most of the time you have to be soft, but at times you may have to be tough. If you read this ruku, the few verses before, Surah Nail chapter 16 verse 125, it says that in Prophet Abraham is a beautiful example. Please be upon him. And what did Prophet Abraham did? He broke the idols. So that was hikmah at that time. So depending upon the situation, hikmah doesn't mean always being soft. Most of the time, yes, being soft, but sometimes you have to be tough. And all these strategies you can hear in my talk I've given. For more information, you can go to my website, zakinnaik.com. There's a separate section, International Dawah Training Program, which gives you various strategies, etc. of Dawah, and will give you a training how to become a Dai. Hope that answers the question. We have on the Facebook Rupam Sinan Supto, Hamid Saifi, Raj Raj, 
Khan Zafar, Metabuddin from Manipur, Kamrul Hassan, Tawseef Sadaf Yarid, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Assalam, Adam Muhammad, Sariful Islam, I love you, Dr. Zakir Naik, only for Allah. I love you too for the sake of Allah. Muqsambil Ahmad, I'm Muzammil from Kashmir. Ratif Islam, I love you, I love you too. Harun Dilsoz, Salaam Alaikum, Fazlul Kareem, I'm watching from New York, MashaAllah. Mursalin Hussain, love for all Muslim. Muhammad Anas, Inshallah, one day Indian Muslim will unite. Ameen. Takiful Bari, Aziz Azmi, Javid Azizi from Afghanistan, Mirza Masroor Beg, Assalamu Alaikum, Dr. Zakir Naik, I love you, I love you too, for the sake of Allah. Jannatul Firdos, Shanta, Muhammad Usman, On the YouTube you have Soman Hussain. We have Muhammad Shan, Asad Timur, Miraj, Ratin Islam, love from Bangladesh, Ahmad Ali, Moni Khan, Bilal Tahir, Bazid Hassan, Kushish Kumari, Kamat Shabib, Dilshad Gautam, Hyderabadi Nizam, Shariar Priyo, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salam. The next question from Muhammad Saud, Lucknow, India. I am a student. Sir, you are a great Muslim influencer for the Ummah. So my Hindu tutor asked me that if I had only one bread and a hungry man comes and asks me for the food and we both are dying of hunger, what does Islam say in such a situation? What should I eat? No, should I eat or should I give him? It's a very tricky question asked by the teacher of Muhammad Saud that if you are hungry and you are dying of hunger and another hungry man comes and he too is dying of hunger and you have only one piece of bread so would you eat it yourself or would you give it to the hungry man what does Islam teach you regarding the reply for such a situation is depending upon the situation if there is a hungry man who comes and I realize that he is dying of hunger and I am dying of hunger too a Muslim or non-Muslim it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity and the verse continues if you save any human being it is as though you have saved the whole of humanity this verse I do not find in any other religious scripture except the glorious Quran that if you kill one human if you kill one innocent human being you have killed the whole of humanity that means killing any innocent human being is prohibited, it is haram, it is the second major sin in Islam. And the verse continues that if you save one innocent human being, it is as though you have saved the whole of humanity. So here, knowing very well that I'm used to fasting, I can stay hungry for a longer time, I have an opportunity, an easy opportunity of saving one human life. So if that non-Muslim who is not used to staying hungry and is dying of hunger, I will give my loaf of bread to him and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may he save me and even God forbid if I die because I saved one human being 
it is as though I have saved the whole of humanity. Inshallah, Inshallah, Allah will put me in Jannah. Hope that answers the question. The next question from Adil Rashid from Kashmir, India. I am a student of class 12th, sir. I have a friend who is a non-Muslim and I am trying to explain to him Islam since the 25th of May 2020. Yesterday he asked a question but I could not give him the answer. The question is that no religion says that if you do not follow God then you will be punished. But in Islam Allah says if you do not obey me then Allah will give you a strong punishment. Isn't Allah egoistic? Sir, my friend is very close to saying the Shahada. If you reply then he may accept Islam soon inshallah. The question posed by Adil he is doing dawah to one of his non-Muslim friends and he is very close to accepting Islam. He asks the question that why in Islam Allah is so egoistic, knows Billah. And he says that if you don't obey me, I will punish you. Whereas in other religion, God does not say that if you don't obey him, you will be punished. I disagree with a non-Muslim friend. In fact, most of the religions say that if you don't obey to God, you will go to hell. Hinduism says that, Christianity says that, and most of the religions. But I do agree with you that Islam is more strong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran is very firm. And is more firm. And he says that if you do not obey the commandments, if you associate partners with anyone else besides him, it is shirk, it is the biggest sin, you will go to hellfire. Islam is more firm, is more staunch, I do agree with you. Let me give you an example and ask you a question so that you understand better. If there is a family who is staying in a tall building on the 20th floor and if the family has a son who is about 5 years old, 6 years old, he wants to jump from the balcony of the 20th floor where he is staying and he tells his father, I want to be Superman and he wants to jump. There is one father who says and tries to explain to his son logically you will not be able to fly, you are not a superman, please don't jump. The second father is the same example. Another father whose son says he wants to jump from the 20th floor, he says don't jump from the second floor, otherwise I will punish you, I will not allow you to go down to play. You have a third type of a father, same situation, son wants to jump from the 20th floor, wants to fly like a superman, but this father, he is more firm. He says, you dare even think of jumping, I will slap you. I will tie you and close you in a room. If you think of even jumping, and if you try jumping also, I will lock you up in a room. I am asking the question. A normal child of the age of five and six, who will he listen to more? The chances of him listening to the first father is more, or chances of listening to the second father is more, or chances of listening to the third father is more. But naturally the answer is that listening to the third father, the chances that the son will not jump from the 20th floor is in the case of the third father. Because the third father is cruel to be kind. He is very firm. I will tie you up. I will slap you. I will lock you in the room. The child will get scared. You cannot say, no, I'll try to explain to him logically, no, he may not understand. The second father says, okay, I will not allow you to go down to play. So what? As long as I fly like a superman, who wants to play? But I will lock you in a room, I will slap you, I will tie you up. It will scare the child. Now, the father, the third father loves this child more. He is willing to go to any extreme to see to it that he doesn't jump and kill himself. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God in Islam, He is very clear-cut and sure that if the person does shirk, 
if you associate partners with Almighty God, it is the biggest sin. He will go to hellfire. So he's telling, do not have alcohol, do not have pork, do not gamble, do not do adultery. All this is beneficial. If you do, you will go to hell. So in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses three types of strategies in convincing the human beings. Number one is with reason and logic. If you read the Quran, there are many verses saying that will you not then understand? This book is for people of understanding. That means talking to them logically. Some people will agree logically. Sometimes people, some verses of the Quran, Allah says, if you do this, I will reward you. I will give you Jannah, in which rivers will flow beneath your feet, in which you will have a lot of fruits to eat, you will have the best of life, giving you rewards. Sometimes, the third strategy Allah uses, if you don't obey me, I put you in hellfire, I will punish you. So there are three types of strategies used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, in Quran and in Islam, to convince the followers to follow the straight path. Whether a human being follows the straight path or not, it makes no difference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will not make him greater, he's already the greatest. But if you follow the commandment, it will benefit the human being. If he doesn't have alcohol, he'll have good health. If he doesn't gamble, it will save him a lot of trouble. You don't do adultery, it will prevent him from several diseases, it will let him lead a good, happy family life. So all these things what Allah commands in the Quran and in Islam, what our beloved Prophet says in the Sharia, it is benefiting the human being, not Almighty God. But Almighty God loves his creature. Allah in Islam is the most loving, most kind, most merciful. Therefore, he wants his creation, the human beings, to follow him. That's the reason Allah is very firm also, trying to give you a warning that don't do all these wrong things, otherwise it will be lost for you. And he even tells them that you get punishment. So this is for the benefit of the human beings. That's the reason today in the world, the religion that is followed most is Islam. In numbers and senses, you may have more number of claiming they are Christian, maybe close to 2.7 billion or a little bit more. Muslims are more than 2 billion in the world, more than 26%. But the percentage, the number of human beings following a religion, number one is Islam. Most of the Christians don't follow the religion. They only name say Christians. So amongst the human beings, the people that follow maximum the religion are the Muslims. It is the Islamic religion. Why? Because the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the strategy of reason and logic. Islam is the most logical religion. Give the strategy of giving reward. The reward that is mentioned in the Quran about Jannah, the description of Jannah is the best as compared to any other scripture. At the same time warning them, you will get punishment, you will get hellfire. The description of hellfire in the Quran is the worst as compared to other scriptures. So the strategy used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most logical, most rewarding, most punishing. That is the reason the people that follow the maximum in religion is Islam. And according to a survey which was done in Germany just about one year back, the people that are the most satisfied and the most happy are the Muslims because of this strategy. Hope this answer will convince your friend and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he give hidayah to your friend and may he accept Islam. And the next question is from Brother Samir Sam. Brother Samir is asking the question that is tattoo haram in Islam? Please answer. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Hadith of Sayyid Bukhari, verse number seven, Hadith number five, nine, four, three, that Ibn Masood, may Allah be pleased with him, said that Allah curses the woman who practices tattooing and who gets tattooing done on herself. 
and the woman that removed the hair from the face and the eyebrows etc and the woman who makes artificial gaps between her teeth to look beautiful or changes what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes the structure what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given her and will I not curse those women who the Prophet has cursed or Allah has cursed in his book this hadith is very clear cut Sahih Bukhari on number 7 hadith number 5943 a similar message is given in Sahih Muslim volume number 5 hadith number 5573 let it be Masood may be pleased with him he said that may Allah curse the woman that practices tattooing and the woman that does tattooing on herself so based on these two hadith both of them are in the sayyain it is muttafiq alayk the highest category of hadith is a hadith which is available in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim it is the highest category of Sahih it's, it says very clearly that tattooing doing tattooing practicing tattooing or having tattoo done on yourself both are haram and Allah curses such people tattooing means you take a needle and you inject dye one of the commonest way is that you take out blood and in place of the blood you put a dye maybe blue color or any other color this is called tattooing but tattooing if it is permanent it's called tattooing so anything which is permanent you inject a dye and you put a color whether it be blue color red color any color and you make a design or whatever it is and that dye becomes permanent part of your skin this type of permanent tattooing is haram in Islam it's not permitted but if it is done on a temporary basis for example you use henna or you use mendi or any color which is temporary for a few days then that is permissible especially henna is permissible mehndi you do a design as long as the design that you're doing with henna with mehndi or any other temporary color it is not against Islam it should not be an image of an animal or a human being as long as it doesn't break the rule of the Islamic Sharia it's permitted but permanent method with a needle injecting dye or there are new methods now if it's permanent color using any sort of design if it's permanent it is changing the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is prohibited in Islam the next question is by brother Shahil Deori from India He's a non-Muslim. Hi, Dr. Zakir. I am 17 years old. I want to accept Islam, but can I accept Islam after I turn 20? Because I don't think that my parents will support me if I accept Islam now. But the child has asked a question that he's 17 years old and he wants to accept Islam, he's convinced with the teaching of Islam but he feels that his parents won't accept him that is the reason he wants to accept Islam after three years when he's 20, where he can stand on his own feet my reply to your question brother is that if you are convinced with the teachings of Islam and you agree Islam is the best religion I would suggest accept Islam immediately because we don't know how long will we live I cannot guarantee whether I will see tomorrow or not. So my advice to you is that if you are convinced with Islam, accept it immediately as soon as possible. And when you accept Islam, you need not proclaim it to the world. Since you are 17 years old and you feel that your parents will not support you, I would say that at least wait till the age of 18. Maybe you will become 18 after a few months or maybe after six months, maximum maybe a year. Till that time, accept Islam. You do your farais, you pray salah, and if after the age of 18, it meant 
18 is the legal age in India where you become an adult and no one can stop you from following any faith. Maybe that is the time you can tell your parents or if you yet want to hide, you can hide. But see to it that you follow the farais. But natural, if you do not proclaim to the world or do not proclaim to your parents or to your family that you become Muslim, it will be more difficult for you to practice Islam. So my suggestion would be that you can convey the message that you have accepted Islam and tell them. But if you feel that it's going to be a big problem for you, it is permitted that you hide from them. And it's not required that, you know, you will wait till you get a good job where you can earn a good living and then you proclaim Islam. It's not required. The moment you realize it is the best religion, accept it. You may or may not convey it to your parents. But my suggestion would be that when you reach the age of 18, you also convey to your parents and do dawah to your parents. I'm sure, inshallah, inshallah, they will not be as angry as you feel. You may never know they will accept. You may never know you may be the zariah to convince your parents to accept Islam. Now, when you accept Islam and you proclaim to your parents, you have a bigger opportunity for doing dawah. You being your you being the son of your parents, it becomes your duty that if you have found the truth, you should also convey the truth to your parents. So my suggestion would be that the moment you reach the age of 18, you accept Islam today. Tell to your parents at the age of 18, you can show them my video cassettes, talk to them politely. But my one request is that when you accept Islam, you have to be more kind to your parents. You have to be more courteous to them. Follow everything what they say, unless those things which are against Quran and the sayings of the Prophet. Only those things which are against the Sharia, only those things you don't follow. Other things you should follow most strictly. For example, you don't like blue color and your mother likes blue color. And they say, son, wear blue, blue color. You wear blue color. Even though you don't like it, wear it because wearing blue color is accepted in Islam. It is mobile. See to it that you love your mother more, that you love your mother more that you care for her more, you take care of her and you talk to her more, be kind to her more, she should see what's happened to my son. How come he's become more kind, more merciful, more loving? Then you should say, this is because this is what my religion teaches, that paradise lies beneath the feet of my mother. I have to respect my mother. I have to love my mother. I have to love my father. So there should be a drastic change in your behavior towards the good not towards the negative. So much so that they should think, oh, what has happened to my son? He's become so good. And they should also start loving the religion of Islam. Inshallah, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may give you the courage to, to accept Islam as soon as possible and may give you the hikmah to dawah to your parents. And I pray to Allah that may he get your parents and your family also to the straight path. Next question is from Shamir from Kerala, India. Sir, one atheist has asked that, can God create a heavy rock that he himself cannot lift? This is a common question that was asked to me also in my school days and my college days, that can God create a rock which you cannot lift. To reply to this question, I normally ask that atheist, that do you know how to drive? And he says, I know how to drive a car. Can you take a left turn? Whenever I tell you, whenever you tell me I can take a left turn. You know how to drive a car? Yes. Can you take a right turn? Whenever I tell you, yes, whenever I can tell, whenever you tell me I can take a right turn. The person is expert in driving a car, if he's expert in riding a motorcycle, okay, tell him. Can you take a left turn whenever I tell you? When you come at a crossroad? Yes, I can take a left turn whenever you tell me, whenever I come at a crossroad. If you come at a crossroad, if I tell you right turn, will you take a right turn? He said, yes, I can take a right turn. I said, okay, now, good. Now, when you come at a crossroad, take a left right turn. The atheist will say, what is a left right turn? Take a left right turn. He will say, I cannot take a left turn. But just now you told me, you can take a left turn whenever I tell you. You can take a right turn whenever I tell you. Now take a left right turn. 
then he understands what I'm telling him is illogical. Yes, he can take a left turn whenever he wants. He can take a right turn whenever he wants. But left and right are two opposing things. You cannot do at the same time. So if you ask, can God create anything? He said, yes, God can create anything. Can he lift anything and everything? Yes, he can lift anything and everything. Can he create a rock which he cannot lift? It is illogical. Yes, God can create whatever he wants. Yes, he can lift whatever he wants. Now you're telling, can God create a rock which he cannot lift? So I asked the why don't you take a left right turn? It's like telling that can God create, can God create a tall short man? Yes, God can create a tall man, he can create a short man. Can he create a tall short man? There are two opposing things, it's meaningless. Can God make a fat thin man? God can make a fat man. God can make a thin man. God can make a fat man into thin man. He can make a thin man into a fat man. But fat thin man, these are illogical things. So the question is illogical. The atheist doesn't know the qualities of God. Yes, this question can be asked to a human being, no problem. Because the human being cannot create everything. A human being cannot lift everything. So if this question is asked to a human being, it makes sense. But the atheist doesn't know the concept of God. That's the reason he's asking this question. So I asked the atheist, can you take a left turn? He said, yes. Can you take a right turn? He said, can you take a left right turn? He says, no. So now he's trapped. So similarly, this question saying, can God create a heavy rock which he cannot lift is an illogical question. So you can answer an illogical question by asking an illogical question back to the questioner. And this way, inshallah, he will realize his mistake. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all powerful. He can do what he wants, but he will not do ungodly things. Hope that answers the question. The next question posed is by Brother Naushad from India. Allah created human beings. Some human beings he gave long life and some short. A long living Muslim can perform more good deeds than the short living Muslim. What if a Muslim wants to perform more good deeds but he dies very soon? Isn't it injustice? Brother Naushad has asked a very interesting question and he says that if a Muslim dies at a very early age, won't it be injustice as compared to a Muslim who is living for a longer time, a person will live for 80 years, the other Muslim will live for 25 years. So isn't it injustice for a Muslim who will live for a short time that he has no opportunity for doing good deeds? If he had lived for a longer time, he had done more good deeds. What Brother Naushad fails to realize that I can ask a counter question also. That the more longer you live, the more evil deeds you can do. So it is disadvantageous to live for a longer time. Because if you live for a longer time, you will do more evil deeds. If you live for a shorter time, you will do less evil deeds. This life doesn't work in this logic. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good indeed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can test people even in short time, even in long time. Suppose a person does good deeds. Allah knows that the average good deeds he'll do maybe, suppose, for example, in a year, a person average does 10 good deeds. So if a person lives for 10 years, he will do 100 good deeds. If he lives for 50 years, he will do 500 good deeds. That doesn't mean a person who does 500 good deeds is better than a person who does 100 good deeds. They are the same. The average is 10 good deeds per year. So it works more on a percentage and various aspects. Allah judges every human being depending upon the quality and the ability he has given. He makes some people rich, some people poor, some people healthy, some people handicapped. The people who are poor, they don't have to give zakat. They get 100 out of 100 in zakat. The person who is rich has to give zakat, has to give more charity. So depending upon the facility, so but natural, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 40, Allah is never unjust in the least degree. There's no question that Allah is, can do injustice. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knows depending upon the ability has given you whether wealth or poverty whether health 
or sickness, whether short life or long life, based on the ability he has given you, he will judge you accordingly. Allah is Malik Yawmuddin, the master of the day of judgment. He knows all these things. No one on the day of judgment will ever tell to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have been unjust. Even the kafirs will be put into hellfire, they'll say, we agree we are wrong. But give us one more chance and Allah will say it too late. Allah gives you thousands of chances in this world. You come in this world only once and then is the day of judgment. Hope that answers the question. This will inshallah be the last question before we end the session. This question is from Isha Arivat from Jharkhand, India. I am born in the Hindu family, but from the past few years, I am a Muslim, Alhamdulillah. My family is absolutely anti-Muslims, and after this Corona and Jamaat incidents, the hatred for Muslims have doubled. I met a boy three and a half years back. He is a Muslim by birth, Alhamdulillah. He gave me the knowledge about Islam, and Allah gave me the Hidayah, and I became a Muslim by heart and soul. Now I want to marry him so that I can follow Islam and inshallah I will. But till the time I am here at my parents' house, I have to face many troubles like I have to hear the cruel words against Muslims, they criticize Muslims, they say bad things about Muslims, they force me to eat prasad, they scold me when I do hijab, they scold me when I say good things about Muslims, they stop me from fasting, they actually don't know that I am a Muslim now, but they have hints. They put question on my character and many other things. What should I do till the time I am here? Sir, the boy I want to marry who gave me the knowledge about Islam never forced me to convert. My family members see news channels such as Aaj Tak and Republic TV and they keep on criticizing my religion Islam. They are hardcore BJP bhakts. Regarding the reply to your question, sisters, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fusila, chapter number 41, verse number 34, that repel evil with goodness. You may never know the person in whose heart is evil, he will become your friend. The person who is your enemy, he will become your friend. So Allah advises, repel evil with goodness. So even though your family members are against you, they are cursing you, they are criticizing you, they are attacking the Muslims. You are the good Muslims and I congratulate you that you have accepted Islam. May Allah support you. You are the good Muslim, should respect your parents, should respect your family members. If they are against you, you have to be better. You have to be kind to them. You have to be merciful for them. You should say, what kind of daughter is this? We are attacking her, we are criticizing her, she is yes, kind, she is yet loving. You have to love your mother more. You have to love your father more. You have to love your brother more. And they should find a marked difference between Isha, what was before becoming a Muslim, and Isha after she's become a Muslim. You should obey them. Only those things what they tell you which is against Quran and the Sunnah, against the commandments of Allah and the things of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, against the Sharia, those are the only things you have to abstain from. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Luqman chapter 31 verse number 14 and 15 and Surah Hujura chapter number 29 verse number 8 that you have to be kind to your parents. But if the parents do jihad, strive and struggle to make you worship somebody else besides Allah, then don't obey them. So only in this time when they ask you to do shirk, do idol worship, don't obey them. When they force you to have prasad, don't obey them, politely refuse them, don't be rude to them. and there should be a marked difference in your behavior. Love them, even if they criticize you. Then I would request you that ask your friend who brought you close to Islam and confirm that does he want to marry you. You may never know. If he brought you close to Islam, he didn't force you, but ask him directly, do you want to marry me and how long will you take since how long will you take to marry me? Ask a direct question. Don't feel shy. If he says it's a few months, no problem. Few weeks, few months, no. If he says too long, then you have to tell him that I cannot practice for long Islam 
in my family. So you have to see to it that you have to tell him to talk to his parents and finalize the marriage as soon as possible. And if he's trying to give excuses, no, I will give you the answer after three years, after four years, then give him an ultimatum. You give me the answer within a few days or a couple of weeks when I going to marry. And see to it that it is very soon in the next few months, maximum a few more months, but don't delay it too much. If you find that he is not very firm, I would advise you look for someone else who is a good Muslim or convince him to marry you fast and marry this person according to the rules of the Sharia, taking the permission of his parents. Inform your parents then the moment he agrees that you have become Muslim, you are an adult, you have a right to choose your life partner and Alhamdulillah after you tell your parents that you have become a Muslim, it becomes your duty that you have to do dawah to them. But see to it that don't behave rude with them. If they are rude to you, you should not be rude to them because paradise lies beneath the feet of your mother. Your mother may not be in paradise, but your paradise lies beneath the feet of your mother. Be kind to her, be respectful to her, and it's your duty that you can then give my talks on similarity between Islam and Hinduism and other lectures of mine. Slowly, slowly talk to them. Only when you talk to them and you speak to them nicely, kindly, with love and affection, and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may give hidayah to your parents and all your family members so that all of you inshallah can enter Jannah. This was the last question and here we'll have to end the session and I would like to remind you inshallah that inshallah we'll meet again next time, next Saturday. But we will meet inshallah five minutes earlier because in Riyadh the sun is setting earlier and my son will start the session not at 11 o'clock Malaysia time, not at, not at 6 o'clock Makkah time, but 5 minutes to